to be here. Um, Dinesh, you have done so many great things for um, ACC and uh, for academic medicine, and it's really an honor um, to be able to sit and talk to you a little bit about what I'm passionate about. Um, recognizing that this was a clinical talk that would span outside of cardiology, I wanted to drive home really a key takeaway from this talk is, is the, that management of peripheral artery disease is multidisciplinary. And it's a, it really takes all of us. You know, we love to use we love to use that term, you know, recruit patients into all of us, but really managing our patients takes all of us. And so I'm gonna scan. Um, so um, the objective today is for you to have a better understanding of really um, why the epidemiology and um, really within that epidemiology, I can list you statistics who are really the vulnerable people populations of patients that you need to be aware of and take care of. In the process, I want you to kind of maybe rethink some of the pathophysiology of peripheral artery disease, as well as if you put one and two together, really say these are the risk factors where I'm going to see a really heightened progression and advancement of PAD. Um, I'm really going to regurgitate um, some of the new and exciting PAD guidelines that were published earlier in the spring. And so that's why I think, you know, now is a good time for us to revisit the, the guideline um, directed pathways for treatment uh, and, di and diagnosis. And then I'm going to share a little bit of my work, um, if we have time, in a couple of slides, kind of showing you where innovation in this field can go. So, um, PAD is really a disease that hides in plain sight. And a lot of the epidemiology we'll get into pretty much underrepresents um, the amount of uh, the degree of, of this, um, this problem. And unfortunately, um, you know, we, we kind of ignore it when we look at other polyvascular diseases, right? You know, we've done really great in the quality spectrum to, okay, door to EKG 10 minutes, door to balloon time 90 minutes. Like we, you know, in our sleep, our pager goes off. We know we know what we should be doing in, in the acute phases of coronary artery disease. We know we need to get people's left, you know, we, we see them in clinic. They need to be on a stat and their LDL needs to be less than 70. We've really worked all of that out. And we've developed a lot of immediate um, therapies and interventions like stenting. Um, we're doing similar work in cerebrovascular disease. And so when we talk about cardiovascular disease, most people think of coronary disease and they think of cerebral disease. And really um, peripheral artery disease um, is, oh yeah, okay, maybe people don't walk as much, but if you don't feel well, you don't, and you, you have all these other risk factors, you don't do as much. And so it's, it's under-recognized. And the problem with under-recognition as a clinician is that our patients are being harmed. And they're being harmed in their quality, not only in their mortality, but also um, in, at the risk of losing limbs and amputations. And to me, that is a disastrous consequence because now you've taken people's mobility away, their ability to potentially contribute in other ways to society, and, and this could have been prevented. So what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about really looking at the vascular tree below um, the aortal ileal um, uh, arteries. And so, you know, normally um, we have right circulation that supplies uh, muscle tissue. Um, and the prevailing hypothesis for a, a very long time was, let's think about coronary disease, okay? You know, you get chronic stable angina, you have a flow limiting lesion, um, in peripheral arterial terms, you talk about this as like an inflow problem, like well, we have this large atherosclerotic plaque in a conduit vessel. Um, I'm going to show you some data that kind of takes that hypothesis and kind of expands it in more of a microcirculatory direction. Okay, there's my conflict of interest. I'm a microcirculation person. Um, but, but this is really, this is the problem that we have is that we have decreased blood flow either in conduit vessels and in microvessels that impair proper matching of um, perfusion and um, metabolism. We say that it affects eight to 13 million Americans. Um, that number again is, is based on symptomology. And so 
symptom out, if this is a largely asymptomatic disease, then we're going to underestimate that. We do see symptoms and we do see more prevalence with age. Um, and, you know, so by and large, a lot of the statistics we have are like 10 years old and they kind of translate into the amount of symptomatic patients is about 7% of um, the population and that um, translates into 8.5 million. Um, again, focused on symptoms. This is an extreme version of um, vascular inflammation and vascular disease. And so patients with PAD are more likely to die of stroke and MI. So if they have PAD, chances are they have all of the other things we just talked about. And, um, and that's important because, again, we want to reduce all of the risk factors um, for our patients. And then finally, amputation rates. Um, with intervention. So if you think of fem pop bypass, the fem fem bypass, all those crazy things vascular surgeons do, we think of um, balloon angioplasty and stenting. Um, amputation rates are extremely high after you start to do intervention. So again, let's be forward thinking and sort of minimize the number of people that actually go on for intervention. So we, Collectively, Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi, the southeast air portion of the country have an incredible opportunity here. And um, the national amputation rate in 2018 is about 45 and a half amputations per 100,000. And this is a heat map that has been constructed with the PAD, by the PAD Collaborative and the AHA. And you can see where we exist is some of the highest um, prevalence of uh, the problem. And so we have a significant opportunity and obligation to help our patients. And so we're going to start to dissect why it is that where we are in the Southeast puts us at increased um, likelihood of encountering patients with PAD. So I, some of these are coming right out of the guidelines. This is your populations to target. So you should be thinking about PAD and people over the age of 65. Um, you need to think about people over the age of 50 who have risk factors for atherosclerosis. Um, and that is um, number one, diabetes. Um, and in fact, diabetes below 50 also is a population. So diabetic patients should be like the number one person that you're thinking about um, in, this, um, in this algorithm. And then obviously um, smoking, high blood pressure, which are common problems that we see. I know Alabama has a significantly high level of tobacco use and it, it shows. Um, these are also high risk populations. I will tell you if you have someone with no cardiovascular risk factors um, and they're under the age of 50, it's actually not appropriate for you to be testing. And I think that's important um, for now. Um, but again, if you, I see more 30 year olds with cardiovascular if you're seeing a 30 year old with coronary artery disease, that puts them in this, you know, and start to think about um, at least risk factor modification. And we'll get into a little bit more of that. Um, and then obviously um, people can have all their vulnerable vascular beds outside of the lower extremities. Um, and so think about people with renal artery stenosis or others, um, there could be chances that there's problems um, for them with their lower extremity. Um, this is a this is again CDC data. It's probably the most cited. It's included in the guidelines. It's kind of included everywhere. That goes to show that by and large, for men and women, there really isn't huge differences in the prevalence of um, PAD. Um, but definitely, you see significant increases with age. Um, and so you can imagine in, in those over the age of 80, about a quarter of the, your patients are going to have some compromised um, blood flow to their lower extremity. Why does this become important, right? Because it not only affects mobility, but you start to, obviously, how many patients have we seen with ulcers and other um, wound care that kind of compromises um, hospitalizations? Um, so um, again, by and large, there aren't a lot of gender differences. Um, Perhaps maybe, you know, um, kind of in 50s, what certain, um, certain populations of women have been shown, but this has been pretty, by, you know, kind of tested time um, without much change. 
All right, so let's talk about tobacco because I kind of started, you know, hey, we see a lot of tobacco use and I'm sure you do in Kentucky, I do in Alabama, not as much in Wisconsin, but you know, there's risk factors and then there's risk factors, right? You know, and I think it, especially for us, taking care of patients, tobacco use is really interesting. And because, um, and I, I love this slide because it actually compares the relative risk of tobacco use across different vascular beds. So obviously if we're not smoking, you know, we have totally unaffected um, vasculature. Um, but what's interesting is, is there's a preponderance in every category, even if you've smoked you know, 10 to 25 years, you start to see significant kind of splaying of the data. And so PED tracks more closely with long-term tobacco use than even coronary disease or cerebrovascular disease. And it persists on some level and starts to regress. I didn't show, there's another slide in this or another figure in this paper that says, okay, what if I quit? Um, if you quit, you know, it's gonna take 10 or 15 years for you to kind of see the PAD um, risk reduce. Um, and so that's why starting with, um, starting with smoking cessation should be the number one plan that you have. So extremely vulnerable population. Oh, and I showed, I did put it in, sorry. I thought, why didn't I put that slide in? So I kind of explained that you can still see persistence, but it does, in, it decreases over the, you know, as you start to, to quit smoking. So again, this is low hanging fruit. We should be really, really harping on smoking cessation. All right, let's talk about hypertension. You're probably thinking, boy, this sounds a lot like a coronary artery um, disease. So, um, so the take home message here is that yes, we can see, um, we can see survival free from PAD um, with changes with blood pressure, right? So, you know, if your systolic blood pressure untreated is greater than 140 over 90, you have a greater likelihood of developing PAD. What's interesting is, is even with antihypertensive therapies, um, you still need, you know, control can be um, absolutely key in this population. So if we look here in this black, um, in this black chart without hypertensive therapy, you know, yes, there's a likelihood, but a very minimal likelihood. But therapy can kind of get you there. And so um, not quite as well, but pretty darn close, I would say. Obviously, we, I blew this up to kind of show these small changes a little bit differently. So aggressive blood pressure is important in this population with a goal less than, um, you know, 130 over 80 and ideally 120 over 80. And the differences between systolic and diastolic pressure are also important. Um, and, um, and basically the take home message here is again, continue to, to make sure that you have aggressive blood pressure management because even small changes in diastolic pressures can actually increase perfusion significantly for perfusion. And that's kind of, again, um, kind of this, this um, shows that even um, if, you, if you really look at the risk factors, there's about a two to four fold difference um, in the incidence of PD with, um, with a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. I think that's important because I still encounter a lot of physicians and patient, well, you know, my patient's a little bit older, you know, I really don't want to be that aggressive with the blood pressure and I get it. Like, I don't want a woman passing out or a man. I don't want to be gender biased towards women. So I don't want any patient to pass out. However, these are not very high numbers and you can see, you know, a fourfold increased risk. And we already know with age, um, you're going to see an increased risk of PAD. So, so really, I think, honestly, the sweet spot between probably 125 and 135, so IE 130 over 80 is probably where, you, where um, you would benefit. And this is not just for PAD, but it's also for cl critical limb ischemia, um, where you see very similar instances. So you may say, oh, this person has had mul multiple interventions, you know, come up with whatever reasons they have more severe disease. Blood pressure control needs to happen. 
I'm really into blood pressure, so this is probably why I'm probably overexplaining these slides, but it's really important that you think about what you're doing for your patients. And then we talked about, um, you know, the guidelines say right off the bat, someone with diabetes, regardless of their age, really needs to be managed um, aggressively and appropriately looking for um, for PAD. And this is why. So these are two graphs from diabetes care. Um, some of this comes from the national inpatient samples um, of data. Um, but what they looked at was they looked at PAD, um, they looked at um, peripheral neuropathy, they looked at the generation of um, ulcers or any lower extremity disease. And they looked at, they looked at patients with and without diabetes. There's two take home points here. One is you can see asymptomatic patients are much more um, prevalent than those that, that actually develop symptoms. Um, so you need to be um, really um, judicious about um, making sure that they are seeing podiatry, that they are doing, you know, um, sensoroneural checks um, and looking for, um, for ulcers. So that, that's the first take home point about this. The second point in this graph is, is when we look at, um, when we look at amputations, we can see that, you know, in someone in the same kind of cohorts, and again, this was data that was taken about 15 years apart, but the, the, same, the same sample, um, if you don't have diabetes, the likelihood of, um, this is total amputations, these are minor amputations, so kind of four foot to the toes, and these are major amputations. If you don't have diabetes, the likelihood of you having any sort of lower extremity amputation is, is really minimal. I mean, it's, you know, 0.1 to 0.25%. And this has been, um, at, at a 15 year sample, like that hasn't changed. However, if you carry a diagnosis of diabetes, what you have here now is, is a significant, um, a significant like five, um, five per thousand per year. Um, so we're talking 50 fold. So again, um, be very judicious with your patients with, um, with diabetes. And I will say dyslipidemia is always complex. You know, I have to say I'm old enough now where it's like we were judiciously checking lipid panels, then we entered this weird period of time where we didn't check lipids. And now we're back to thankfully aggressively checking lipids. The significance of lipids and PAD is basically, um, I would say fairly complicated in the sense that um, we set LDL targets, um, but we, recognize that maybe triglycerides may have more of a bigger impact and kind of predicting risk. Um, so uh, I, I leave you with that, um, showing that in, if you looked at quartiles of data um, from the physician health study and the women's health study, that it seems like triglycerides and um, HDL were more strongly associated with PAD and the LDL was more for coronary disease. Um, but truly, again, this is an inflammatory risk that we need to manage. And then I think this is also interesting to know. And I, I you know, I was talking with Dr. Calra before, and he's like, you know, one of the one of the first metrics of quality is making sure we're thinking about um, how race, ethnicity, and other social determinants of health affect um, peripheral artery disease. And this is why. So. Um, so, again, this data comes from MESA, and it looked at, you know, strati stratifying prevalence um, with respect to race and with respect to age. And there's a couple of take-home points. So, um, A is men and B is women, okay? So, panel A shows that African-American men have um, significantly higher levels of peripheral artery disease. And it starts earlier, um, and it starts earlier than basically all of the other cohorts. Mm -hmm. To some degree, Hispanic men have it, but not to the, the significant extent that African American men do. For women, you see a different curve, but again, very similar that you see Hispanic women and, and African-American women also have significantly elevated 
um, levels of um, PAD. And they also start a little bit earlier than the other um, American Indian, um, non-Hispanic whites and Asians. Moreover, some of this is also related to um, the fact that the presentations occur later. So um, later in the course of the disease, not later in age. Um, so remember a lot of this is developing symptoms. Um, so they tend to develop symptoms earlier and more aggressively. And there's a couple of reasons why that happens um, that I'm gonna get into. But first of all, we need to really address the, that's fine, we've made these, is it just race? Is it just ethnicity? Um, are there comorbidities or what other health disparities there are? And this is where I look at Alabama um, and this is rural medicine and we, this is very difficult to access care. So to me, this is a health disparity that is incredibly important. I told you the national amputation rate was 45, we're at 65. And there's still even, um, there's, if you look at where I live in Birmingham, which is right here, it's actually pretty low. If you go here, um, you're seeing like, honestly, a doubling, a doubling of the, um, the severity of, P, of PAD cases. And I will tell you, it's palpable. And so UAB receives a lot of patients um, and the amount of people with amputations is shocking. And I came from the upper Midwest. No one really has amputations. Now let's look at Kentucky and you'll do a better job of navigating the geography of this, but you're better than us we're 65, but you're at 59.6. So there's a lot of opportunity, again, and I would suspect kind of knowing this area of the country, I wish I had a pointer, but you know, that, that Southeast corner, what perhaps your access to care may be a little bit difficult. Um, I don't know, I'd love to hear from you why that is, but you can see there's air, most of your state has areas of opportunity and they didn't seem to be localized by any significant like urban centers. So, um, so finally, again, just kind of almost a no brainer. Um, you know, if you have more than one area that's affected by atherosclerosis and inflammation and vascular disease, you're, you're, you have a significant increase of um, uh, MACE and you're at increased risk of having amputation. So let's kind of step back. I said, we're gonna talk about these vulnerable populations and perhaps why is it that we see with certain health disparities, um, uh, you know, is it just an access of care issue? And it's probably, again, it's never that, um, it's never that straightforward. But I think, again, we talked about geography, um, rural access to care is a problem in Alabama. It's somewhat of a problem in Wisconsin, I will say that. Um, I'm going to only guess because I've been in two states that if I came to Kentucky, rural areas are going to ha have a harder time getting the care that they need in order to identify that they have a problem. I will say with respect to race and ethnicity, the Mesa data with American, uh, Native Americans wasn't as impressive as I expected. So when I looked at that, those graphs and preparing this talk, I thought, you know, and, uh, Native Americans have some of the worst cardiovascular disease, but yet they're, why would they be um, like somewhat, you know, closer to a non-Hispanic uh, white? And that it's because, again, we haven't done a great yet. Um, despite um, all of our um, surveys, we don't always do a great job collecting that um, population. I will also say they tend to present incredibly late um, for management and are at risk of amputation. And so there's been more recent data that's come out, but nothing published in, in, uh, in a graph like that. So we need to be recognizing these vulnerable populations have to be brought in a little bit earlier. Um, obviously, lower quality of education and health literacy are real problems. We need to educate our patients um, about why it's important that they check their blood pressure, manage their blood sugars and um, their lipids. Um, we have 
access problems to healthy foods. Um, and I think Dr. Farrell, we've done we've done some great work in the ACC around using food as medicine and trying to get healthy foods out into vulnerable communities. Um, we have um, inadequate um, primary care, quite frankly, and it's not because we don't have enough willing um, people who are invested in it, it's their access to getting um, adequate health insurance leads to poor access to care. Physiologically, we've talked about all of, most of these risk factors here, but ones that we haven't really talked about is, is that when you see in certain populations, you know, cr chronic kidney disease is a huge problem for the African-American uh, individuals. Um, we need to make sure that, that that's being managed because that's placing them at an additional risk. Um, and so that we, what we might be seeing is earlier manifestations of, all, of comorbidities that make them um, more likely to develop PAD. And then what's on here is microvascular disease, which I'm gonna talk about, which has been really under-recognized, but I think is really the area of opportunity for treatment. So let's talk about the pathophysiology. Um, so um, we talk about a lot about atherosclerosis and thrombosis, um, which um, I kind of touched on, on at the beginning. And unfortunately, what happens is, is like, you know, we don't always get because of turbulent flow and eddy currents, you know, those tend to be areas where plaque can accumulate. And so what you can oftentimes end up with is is almost skipped lesions in some of these conduit vessels. When you have flow limiting um, obstructions, what you end up with is a lot of fibrosis and muscle atrophy. Moreover, um, you know, we look at microvascular dysfunction in the next slide, but just to kind of tee up this concept, you know, the majority of blood flow reg regulation between metabolism and blood flow occurs in the arterioles, you know, right before the capillary. And so if you have microvascular dysfunction here, you're already, no matter if these were clean vessels, you're, you're not, your body is not responding to the metabolic cues appropriately. And that will also contribute to long, uh, low level ischemia. The end result from all of this is, is that you have you lose um, you lose muscle you lose tissue and you lose access for blood cells to do their job and so that's where when we start to see some of these lovely pictures and I'm sorry I will show them I'm glad most of you have eaten lunch um, but but really focusing on endothelial function in um, peripheral artery disease is important because it allows us to kind of rethink this idea that you know, every intervention that we do is gonna somehow be helpful. And we've seen this in the coronary space, right? You know, you see people who despite having like, okay, they've had this stent, this bypass, they still have residual symptoms, the same applies in PAD. And so this is um, what we do to measure in humans as flow, uh, flow mediated dilation, which is basically putting a blood pressure cuff around, um, around your uh, upper arm and you inflate the cuff, and then you measure reactive hyperemia um, with a Doppler probe. And you also use ultrasound um, to show how much the, the brachial artery responds. And we measure these in percentages. And a normal change is about 5%. You can see in patients um, who carry a diagnosis of PAE, um, if, the, if we put them under this flow mediated dilation protocol, you'll see less than a 3% change, which is about half. So we know their microvascular function is not working. And, and again, if you compare someone with type 2 diabetes and PAD, it's about the similar. So this was very important for me as a physician scientist to see because it's allowed me to develop some therapies that might attack this problem after we had our interventional cardiologists and vascular surgeons fix that, that inflow in problem. The other thing to note is I talked about this, you know, we see symptoms of claudication still persisting. And we also know that if we put you on a structured exercise program and you have PAD, you're gonna do better. And we'll talk about that in the guidelines. And then, um, and again, really just reinforcing that diabetes is really um, a main risk um, and that's quite frankly, simply 
inflammation. You know, we see this all the time. We think about it more and more. And, um, you know, inflammation contributes to um, a lot of changes in how our mitochondria and some of those subcellular organs um, behave. Um, it places us at increased risk of oxidative stress. I'm a nitric oxide, like, file, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, I love it. Um, I'm a nitrophile. Um, and, and really without, if oxidative stress breeds all of these really bad signaling cascades that then allow us to develop atheromas. Um, it also allows um, a series of inflammatory cytokines, again, to develop atherosclerosis and affect, um, and affect microvascular function. More, uh, more importantly is, is if we can act on some of these pathways earlier on, we might have an opportunity to treat patients. And again, this is a lot of, I said I'm a nitrophile. Um, I focus a lot on how I can generate nitric oxide in the face of nitric oxide being dysfunctional. Um, and so ENOS is the enzyme that makes most nitric oxide. It doesn't work in diabetes very well. It doesn't work um, one, because there's not enough produced uh, ENOS enzymes produced, and it's also uncoupled. It actually creates oxidative stress. So if this pathway is dysfunctional, how can we still get it to work? The other thing that I would say, which is also important, is, is why do we focus on lipid-lowering therapy? Because it's anti-inflammatory. And we know statins are anti-inflammatory. We know that PCSK9 inhibitors, um, again, act on reducing inflammation. And obviously if we can reduce inflammation as well as providing you know, the, the uh, oxidized LDL to the vessel, we can stop the conversion of macrophage to foam cells and, and obstruction. So aggressive lipid lowering therapy is a key physiological or a key therapy to reduce the pathophysiology of this inflammation. All right, so I want to make sure I'm not boring you all to death here. But um, one of the things I want to point out is, is that part of the problem with PAD is, is we think about this as either claudication or I need to amputate somebody's wound because they have an ulcer. And what I want you to think about is, is it can be more dynamic than that. And so um, asymptomatic patients, like I said, um, may have some sort of functional impairment, but they've kind of masked it here. Um, and that's where we start, anywhere from 20 to 60% of patients. Where do I get 60% of? Is if I take a cohort of people and I do an ankle brachial index, it'll be less than 0.9. It'll be like, I have no problems, okay? So think about that. Again, they, they cover up their symptoms, right? They limit their activities. And so really, this population of people is gonna do really well with provoking their symptoms by walking tests. Um, they are not at any lower risk for major cardiovascular events than the symptomatic people. So this is a, this is a huge population that you need to be looking for. Um, asymptomatic people can go in two directions. They can become, um, they can have the classic intermittent claudication. Um, and if you really provoke with exercise, you can prove um, about 80% of these patients are actually symptomatic. Um, again, alleviating with rest, um, but not all the time, right? Because they're trying to still mask their symptoms. And so sometimes they'll say, well, you know, I really, it's not really that bad, you know, but I only walked this far. So again, really driving in on the history is important in this population because this, these are the groups we're going to start driving here. Asymptomatic people may never reach this step and they may go to, um, critical limb, uh, life, a limb threatening ischemia. That's about 10 to 20% of your population. And these are people who have really the rest pain for more than two weeks. It's very severe. And they are at the highest risk of MACE and uh, male, which is limb am uh, amputation. And then finally, there's in a group, we're not gonna talk about it today, but it's the acute limb ischemia. These are a very small population of individuals. That's your, you know, like 
for an internist or a cardiologist, unlikely to see unless you're in the ED. You know, it's like the pulseless pallor, pain, you know, paresthesias, um, change in temperature. Um, and this is something where it's kind of acute onset less than two weeks. I will say this population of people most often comes from those that had critical limb threatening ischemia that somebody's done a lot of procedures on. So a lot of ballooning, a lot of stenting, a lot of things, especially below the knee, um, has not proven to be very effective. And it kind of can set you up for an increased risk, uh, risk of um, acute limb uh, ischemia. So sorry for the pictures. Um, again, the critical limb ischemia is um, is basically you know what you see here. Um, you see wounds that do not heal. You have the classic you know if I tip my my foot up, it's white. If I drop it down, it uh, you know or I I lower it, um, it can be very erythematous. This is again a, a subset of individuals that have high mortality for cardiovascular disease, and you can kind of bet that it's almost like 10% per year with this diagnosis that they're gonna have a coronary, uh, that they'll die of coronary artery disease. Um, they have high rates of mortality after um, amputation. So these are, um, uh, these are, again, people that you need to aggressively manage in a team-based setting. Um, these are standard classifications that for most clinicians are not that important, so I'm not going to take a lot of time with them. These are what we use when we start to measure the um, whether an intervention improves. Um, so the majority of um, times, I think the Rutherford is a much more, um, I think, objective criteria where we're putting people on treadmills. We're actually monitoring their symptoms and recognizing how much um, their um, their their pain, their resting, their pain changes, and how long they can exercise. Um, if you get to um, a lot of the guidelines are kind of directed based on this, but basically, if you're asymptomatic, you're zero. If you need, um, if you need amputation, you're at three, and then two is kind of a gradation of claudication to uh, ischemic rest. And we have a, a version for acute limb ischemia, which I think is helpful to know, um, and that's why I included it. Um, but not probably practical for this practice that we do. So what should you do with your patients that you think might be at risk of um, PAD? Get an ankle brachial anesthesia. It has a very high sensitivity for significant stenosis. So again, even if they're asymptomatic, this is going to be the test for you. Less than 0.9 is diagnostic for PAD, which is why the more ABIs we do, the better epidemiological data that we can have. Um, there are borderline values, um, less than one, um, and actually greater than one also uh, pretends um, potentially non-compressible arteries. And so you'll likely see those in patients with CKD, diabetes, and elderly patients. And that may be some of the, we talked about why, you know, African Americans may have a higher risk of having limb amputation and they, because they present late. It may be that even if somebody does the right thing, if they don't, think about what tests they're ordering and why, and they may think it's a normal test and it really isn't. Um, follow up the ABI, we use a cobrachial index, um, which is basically a blood pressure cuff around the toe. It measures the pressure and it compares it to either of the higher ones in your, um, your brachial um, artery. And then if you really can't get anywhere there, um, between an ABI and a TBI, um, then we can start to put patients on um, treadmills and kind of like break down um, how do they behave in exercise. Um, because 30% of patients with PAD have symptoms but can have normal resting values. And then once you get them exercising, again, you can kind of unmask the disease. And this is really important that we do the correct tests. Um, I know a lot of you love imaging in the day. CT, MRI, um, even duplex ultra, these are all good things to do, but they're really more for the surgeons and the interventionalists who are gonna intervene on symptomatic patients. So for my vantage point as a non-invasive cardiologist, um, or if I'm an internist or a family medicine doctor, it's ABI all the way. So this is our diagnostic strategy. 
Um, so if you think somebody's at risk for PAD, they do not have wounds or ulcers that would make us think of uh, limb-threatening ischemia, we start with the ABI. We risk stratify it, as I showed you. And then depending on um, what we have, like I said, that gray area of 0.9 to less than 1.4, we're gonna do an exercise treadmill. That's a class one indication. If you really get a, a positive result, there really isn't a need to do uh, an exercise treadmill, but again, um, may be helpful. Um, everyone else um, really needs to be really thoroughly examined. And again, for those individuals over um, 1.4, we need to go that second step with the toe um, brachial indices. Once we've diagnosed that patient, again, we're depending on their symptoms. Now we're thinking symptoms are gonna drive what we have. We're going to either further characterize um, with, um, with Doppler, as I just kind of alluded to, um, and see, are they gonna be a candidate for something else like CT, MR, which is an interventional base, or if they're asymptomatic, we're just gonna really focus on um, guideline-directed medical therapy. So really the guidelines are very, they're very direct and they're very specific. ABI first to diagnose, ankle break, uh, excuse me, exercise ABIs if you, if you really are unsure. Um, and if you do see PAD, then you have to ask them, ask, is this an asymptomatic person? Yes, guideline-directed medical therapy. If they're symptomatic, then we're gonna have to do some planning. And then it makes sense to do imaging. So CT and MR should never be at the, the beginning. It really needs to be at the end of the diagnostic um, workflow. If you have somebody with wounds, that's obviously a higher level. Um, so you're suspecting limb-threatening ischemia. You're gonna repeat that ABI um, but you're also going to get a sense of really, I talked about tissue loss and tissue perfusion. We're going to look at um, anything from skin pulse pressures and, um, and transcutaneous pulse ox. These, again, you're going to be referring to a vascular specialist. So from your vantage point, if you see this, you're going to do the ABI and it's going to be a referral. Um, and again, those that need to intervene need to understand, is this a salvageable tissue limb or is it, is it one that um, warrants um, amputation versus intervention? And that's kind of what we have here. So I've talked about primary care. I've talked about podiatry. I've talked about cardiology. I've talked about vascular surgery. I've talked about having really good imagers, and vascular medicine doctors. It sounds like we need a team, right? So, um, so you need to think about interdisciplinary care because it really helps. One, for risk mat aggressive risk factor modification. Two, is making the right intervention. As I told you, you don't want people at risk of, um, of acute limit ischemia, which really threatens amputation, if we aren't thinking about what we're doing and how we're treating the patient. So putting them on the right medical interventions, preventing wounds from ever happening, and then getting a graded exercise program to really kind of stimulate and recruit that microcirculation. And then we always have to be worried that limb-threatening ischemia is, is something for ever, that could happen to any of our patients. Therefore, we need to be constantly on the lookout. And then one, work with um, social workers and others to kind of work through some of the social determinants and health disparities that we see. So it's pretty easy from a therapeutic standpoint or a management standpoint. If you're asymptomatic and you carry a diagnosis now of PAD, you've all done your work. Um, you found that patient with uh, ABI less than 0.9. Thankfully, they don't have any symptoms, but we're gonna get really aggressive really quickly. So um, if they aren't diagnosed with um, CAD, with respect to like an MI or an uh, ACS in the last 12 months or a stroke, a statin goal, a LDL, or a LDL goal of less than 70 um, is appropriate. If you have any other um, vascular um, diseases, then we'll go to less than 55. I kind of hammered on the less than 130 over 80. ACE ARBs are recommended. And um, I think this is a great opportunity for diabetes management. So. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors are actually, there had been a black box warning on them for a risk of PAD. They should be on SGLT2 and GLT1s. 
Um, so please, that has been incorporated. I've actually argued with endocrinologists about this point, how much you can give an SGLT2 inhibitor to people who have EAD. The concern is somehow that that higher amount of glucose, if there's anything that can come in contact with the skin can increase wounds and risk of amputation that's not borne out. Um, and then preventive, uh, preventive foot care, smoking cessation, and, um, and a single antiplatelet therapy, you know, clopidogrel or aspirin. Um, chelation agents, vitamin B complexes, some of that other stuff has never played out. Um, so please do not give those. This is, again, wound prevention starts with a good history and physical exam. Um, I think, you know, we need to, again, remember those who are most vulnerable, those that already have peripheral neuropathy, have already damage to their, um, to their um, feet um, and who are active smoking. All right, for those who are symptomatic, I think um, there's things we can do as um, internists and as practicing cardiologists. And then there's things we have to think about um, um, with respect to intervention. Since this, this is what I do, I'm gonna, gonna again, talk more about um, what do we do with the symptomatic patient. In this case, these are patients that have claudication or they have wound-threatening ischemia. They need to be on antiplatelet and antithrombotic therapies. However, the COMPASS, so COMPASS showed really elegantly um, that aspirin plus rivaroxaban in a low dose actually reduces male and, and mace in this population. So if they have not been, if they have not been recently revascularized, I am now actually going more towards this route of doing um, rivaroxaban and low dose aspirin. Um, again, for if there, you know, I, again, it's a sort, it could be a disparity or a social determinant, some people can't afford rivaroxaban, then you really can pick aspirin or platelet. If they've gone through something um, either endovascularly or surgically, we're gonna keep them on um, antiplatelet therapy and consider DAPT um, and or um, Compass also has a, um, they're kind of extending this to look at it, but right now we're basically looking at, at DAPT. Um, medical management looks a lot of the same, except we're including two um, important elements. One is celastazole. Um, it's uh, a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. Um, it, is, it, it works in some patients. It's contraindicated in any history of CHF. So do not use that to your, um, for your patients. Um, structured exercise, which is insur it's insured, um, and is covered by Medicare is important. Um, and it should be something, again, that, um, that we should do because it kind of recruits um, microvascular flow. Um, the goal of wound care is to make sure that we're debriding as much non-viable tissue as possible. We don't want to extend those margins and we want to reduce pressure. <laughs> Even use of diuretics can be helpful to kind of um, allow um, optimal um, wound healing. And again, medical optimization. Um, graded exercise, you can see the number of indications, um, which is really important. It, inc it increases muscle, um, muscle mass. Um, and we have looked at um, walking distance um, and quality of life improves. And these are all the reasons why um, it's important. Considering revascularization, I'm going to just touch on it briefly. Um, I want to make sure that you know we end on time. But um, really, if, if you have somebody that you've done all of those things, then you're really looking at. Um, and again, they probably should already be hooked into um, a vascular surgeon or a, a cardiologist that specializes in vas specializes in vas vascular diseases, because now you're talking about someone who has um, symptomatic limitations. And we're not gonna get there with just medicines alone and it's affecting their quality of life. If they can't be as active and structured exercise has uh, failed, then we need to think of revascularization options. I'm only, I only put this here to kind of remind me like what are our options? And a lot of times um, 
uh, endarterectomies um, and endovascular approaches um, are reasonable when you have hemodynamically significant diseases. That is going to be a um, that is going to be kind of a, a team based approach um, with surgeon and interventionalist to pick um, really which one is going to be effective. But you can see in general most of these are two A and two B indications. You know unless they have aortic or fem uh, femoral popliteal disease that's truly hemodynamically significant that has been measured, you know, you get a, you get a class one indication. Most of the time you're, you're, you're managing this medically. And again, um, I think, you know, deciding what makes somebody a good um, revasculariz revascularization candidate, um, according to the guidelines is really, again, how have they done what extent of wounds, um, are there any optional therapies left for them? And you can see in a couple of areas, we have no optional therapies or, you know, so this really now starts to send patients down a path of amputation. And again, that's not what we want. So new, so this no option is a true area of opportunity. As you can see, we have a lot of 2B indications. I always say to my fellows, we try not to be 2B practitioners, um, but sometimes you need to be. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in these no options, they've looked at prostanoids. Um, they've looked at uh, essentially it's called pneumatic compression, but it's it's basically kind of a pneumatic blood pressure cuffs that kind of try to stimulate angiogenesis and um, and regrow in an area that has poor perfusion. That's not going to work in the long run. So in the last like two minutes, I want to share what I do. Um, and I look at um, red light in the 670 nanometer um, as a potential therapy for PAD. And the reason why um, I thought it might be good is one, it's non-invasive. Um, and two is, is this is a tissue, an optical window um, within the tissue where absorption of light energy occurs and water absorption of energy is minimized. So you have some de degree of penetration into the tissue, but you also don't have the tissue heating. You know, so a lot of times people are under the misunderstanding that, oh, red light, you know, like it's a heat lamp. Well, there's more to a heat lamp than just red light. Um, this is why, um, you, oh, you're just heating the tissue or you're just heating the blood, the blood vessels and you can either damage them or have confounding, um, confounding data. It's remarkable how people are using red light. It can grow hair. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Um, it can uh, it can actually um, be used for um, for uh, exercise. So now these high performance athletes are, are doing it. Um, Obviously, if you go to a meta spa, they love selling you this. They're now using it for liposuction and for pain relief. So I looked at this back in the day when my, um, when my mentor wanted me to look into red light. And I said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Nobody could make a career out of this. I've managed to figure out, I think on some level, why red light works. And we won't go into that because we don't have time. But what I wanted to share with you is, is it actually increases peripheral blood flow in healthy subjects and patients with peripheral artery disease. So I'm using contrast enhanced ultrasound in order to measure the blood flow in the gastric nemius and soleus muscles. Um, and I've been able to show that um, before, during, and immediately after um, red light, um, I can see increases in blood flow. And even in, the, in patients with significant PAD, they can reach levels that kind of mimic normal resting flow in, in healthy subjects. So to me, this has been very interesting because it's allowed us to work on the light PAD trial. And Mary McDermott at Northwestern um, and I got together and we looked at patients who actually were treated with, for 10 minutes um, with red light and then they did a six minute walk test. And you can see that there's about a, a 14 to 17, depending on if we use a NO, like a nitrite um, supplement, uh, increase in walking distance um, with just one exposure. So the goal of this NIH trial, um, which is funded, is that we're looking at um, 
the impact of red light to um, increase perfusion, but also look at um, the skeletal muscle architecture. Um, we're going to randomize patients to sham light or red light, measure nitric, uh, I told you I was a nitrophile, um, increase nitric oxide metabolites, um, look at mitochondrial bio, uh, biogenesis and activity, and then look at how the six minute walk test has changed. So this is so crude, um, we're working on refining it, but basically you just have to sit um, and have these lights um, just kind of bathe, you know, the, your calves. Um, and then um, we'll do that every day for four months. We set them up in their houses. And so far she's done a great job recruiting um, for this trial. So um, the 10 takeaways from today's talk should be that this is an underrecognized problem that needs primary care screening and general cardiology screening. If you have a patient, you should really probably think about um, getting an ABI. Um, don't go after patients under the age of 50 unless they have diabetes or some constellation of risk factors that I kind of shared with you. Um, be suspicious because asymptomatic KD is, is more common than you know. And medical therapies are really the main, is the mainstay, um, including risk factor modification and exercise programs. Nobody, nobody should think of like, oh, I'm getting an ABI and I'm gonna send them to have something done. I think, um, I know we have worked a lot with ACC and AHA about how we, um, how we make sure that quality is at the center of what, and patient care is at the center of what we do. And that unfortunately, a lot of people can, um, and Congress is looking at this actually, there's legislation about this idea, we're gonna just measure ABIs and then we're gonna do procedures. Um, that needs to change and we're advocating for that. So that's why interventions should be re reserved once medical therapy fails. And again, get yourself as part of a great team. We have great cardiologists, vascular medicine doctors, podiatrists, but really primary care is the, the hallmark. These are the people that need to be referring them to us. Um, and, um, and we need to do this with shared decision-making for the patients that, you know, if we're gonna bring you in for a surgery or some sort of endovascular procedure, you know, thinking of your, your a patient's quality of life, their comorbidities, the anatomy of what we're dealing with, they may or may not benefit from some of those interventions. And then finally, you know, we need to think of the no option patient, you know, and there needs to be innovative therapies and hopefully someday before I die, I'll be able to impact that in a meaningful way. And we didn't touch on it, but again, acute limb ischemia is a vascular emergency and is at a higher risk of those who've had multiple um, endovascular procedures. Um, so in the end, let's try to prevent amputations. And I thank you um, for your time. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of, I so cure kind of, you know, so some of that older data had really shown like for the PAD population, perhaps the, um, you know, clopidogrel is a little bit superior for other risks. So I tend to go that route, but in those who don't have access to it, aspirin is, is probably nearly as fine. Um, I think the addition of rivaroxaban is a great is a great um, update. Um, I think we all have these, this anecdotal evidence of you have these, these some of these patients they just keep coming back to you with more and more problems. And I got frustrated with a veteran. I don't know. I was probably in my first year as an attending, and uh, you know he was already on DAP. Like where do you go from DAP? And I thought, well, let's just put him on Coumadin. You know, at the time, I hate to say it, I'm that old, but DOACs were just kind of coming out. You know, so. Warfarin was like the gift for him, like had no more procedures after that. And, and there's data there that shows that a lot of the anti-inflammatory response actually can be mitigated with these GOACs. Um, so that's why it's really important to have some degree of antiplatelet therapy. And I think adding a, that low dose of river oxygen really does work. Sure. Uh, thank you for a great lecture. Uh, my question is about now knowing that I probably should order ABIs on 
percent of my clinic patients that I'm about to see. Is there a role for patients that you diagnose PAD and they're in the asymptomatic category to try to exercise them to see if they're truly asymptomatic or if that carries them over to the symptomatic category, knowing that you know now you have different medication you can offer them, and before they get into that to the evidence area where there's not a whole lot to do. Yeah, and I think if you go back in the guidelines, you know they do kind of give you like a you can do a, an exercise ABI and a treadmill to kind of see if you can provoke symptoms. Um, I think you know siloxazole is used. It's it's an okay it's an okay drug. I think what I'm hearing from you is, okay, should this spur me on to get them on a low dose of rivaroxaban? Um, and I think that's a, I think that would be reasonable. Um, I try very hard to like, well, what are you doing? You know, or tell me, you know, my clinic is always like, tell me, you know, what are you doing for fun? You know, any activity. So try to really get it out of the history first, but if you can't, then go with it. Asymptomatic patient. If you have symptoms, so the hallmark of all of that, and, and again, the guidelines, I think, really emphasize that is no matter what, there's a one, there's one A evidence for aggressive risk factor management. So again, we're going to treat that LDL. I, to be honest with you, I'm more of a European than an American. So God help me, I'm trying to get everybody to 55, you know, or less, right? So, I mean, really be aggressive on the lipids, really be aggressive on the blood pressure, and if they have diabetes, you know, make sure that you're having a conversation with the endocrinologist that, that says they really need to be on an SGLT2 or a GLP. Sure. Dr. Williams. Oh. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know how that works. They're like looking at me. I'm. Have to come back. There it is. Hi. 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 How are you? Good. Thanks. How are you? Good. 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 Thanks so much for coming. Um, so you know, you know me. So I only ask questions about health equity, and, and you actually covered that. If we had earlier diagnosis, like you were uh, recommending, uh, we would not have this huge disparity in uh, limb salvage and more amputations in the African American community, which is one of our worst healthcare disparities in the United States. Um, but the other one, the other question, of course, is about nutrition. Journal Vascular Surgery, about five years ago, published a large trial. It was using the Esselstyn diet, of course, uh, because that's the one with the most plaque regression data. Uh, and they showed about it, you know, your red light was about a 16% uh, improvement in flow. Um, they had, a, they found a 31% improvement in flow uh, with uh, a whole food plant-based diet. What what is it that you could that we could do to try to democratize this type of therapy? It's it's out there, it's waiting, um, and we're just not doing it. I mean, I agree with you, and you you and I have sat on enough of the you know where we're trying to get the word out about how healthy eating really is um, is medicine, and I think honestly, for me, it's always going to be a three prong pronged approach. One is is educating us to be more um, insistent upon trying to figure out one, how to integrate nutritionists into our practices. And it's something I'm trying to do in my own. Um, two is educating patients of really understanding really the harm of the food that we eat. And I think the third is advocacy. And I really think that we as physicians um, need to show up to our state houses to advocate for our patients. You know, we've had some successes sporadically, right? You know, whether it's a, a, a tax on sodas or it could be um, making sure that there's matching programs for SNAP proceeds to go to um, to farmers markets or, or healthier food. Sure. Um, but sure. you can, but that's, that advocacy is great, but it has to be, I think, meshed with getting into our elementary schools and our high schools and, and teaching, you know, more plant-based eating. Very well said. Thank you for that. I have a question about the lipid data you showed. Yeah. Thank you for, by the way, for putting our, I think we wrote a review in 20. You did, and I, I, and I should have, I should have acknowledged you. No, no, no. 
about the PCSB9 specifically yes. in that first uh, slide you showed, I think it was the second slide, in one of the studies, LDL did have a strong correlation, but the PCSB9 data shows that the lower you drive down the LDL, the lower your MACE, especially at evolutionary, I think they had a sub-analysis in the year that showed that. They and You're it's right. Just, it's just strange that, you know, with PAD, as you showed, the event rates are so much higher. And atherosclerosis starts first in the aortic iliac, so bioimage and with PACE, and we've seen that. We actually screen some of our younger patients with ultrasound. So maybe it's the fact that just that part of the circulation, because of anatomy or physiology, is exposed more to endothelial injury early on in life. And so that's where the outcomes are worse. And maybe we just need to be way more aggressive. You know, we have a patient with BAD instead of saying, this is like CAD, get it down to less than 70. I say get it down to less than 40. And it's not been tested, but I think that's something really interesting to look at. So I, I didn't have a question with that. I was just making a comment. You know, I think BAD is so much worse than CAD. It, it absolutely is. And it's it's um, interesting because, you know, we've seen a lot of the, the lipid trialists, you know, it, it's a beautiful curve. You know, your MACE with coronary disease is linear to your, your LDL. Um, I think to your point, you have the coronary blood flow and the, the dynamics of eddy currents and, you know, like what you see in a coronary circulation is very different than what you see in the lower extremity. So there's probably some contributor there. I think what was interesting and why I raised that is, is that if you look at um, if you look at population data, it does improve out. But to your point, and that was a discussion part of the guidelines that actually said, but hey, but we have this randomized clinical trial data that shows that there was a, a reduction in, in PAD, and that's why we're still going to be aggressive about lipid lowering. To me, it's it. You cannot do good risk factor modification without trying to drive down an LDL. That's just how I feel. So, so much of PAD is under the water level, like it's an iceberg. Like we don't detect 90% of it on our Yeah. Like what Kelly was saying. So yeah. When we ask, we don't detect. Just have a couple of questions, actually. Maybe uh, so, uh, how about alcohol this preferred their disease? Second thing is coronary artery disease. I usually, when I have these patients, I love them more as peripheral arterial disease. Uh, and the third thing is multidisciplinary team is very good idea, but mostly the patient population that I see, especially at the university in downtown here, they have access, hard access to just one physician, and they have problems with transportation. And back in the days, cardiology can manage diabetes, can prescribe uh, alcohol physician medications, uh, smoking. Right now, we are just focused on one thing. And we just basically, I write in my notes even with just target A1C less than seven. However, as an internist, I can just prescribe it, but I never do it. I can prescribe it. But not so I love every single one of those questions. Alcohol, the more studies we do on alcohol, I mean, we're pretty much at the point where, you know, alcohol is inflammatory. There really isn't a whole lot of upside to alcohol use. So um, it's not listed specifically in the guidelines, but when you talk about lifestyle changes, don't do something that inflames you. Okay. So that's my easy approach to that. Um, it, the second part about, um, how to like, how to provide that interdisciplinary care. I think as, um, as someone who's an administrator, what I'm trying to do is figure out how do we, how do we figure out great ways of building those types of programs so that you have those opportunities. As a VA physician, I was the multidisciplinary. I talked to the social worker. I, I started putting patients on SGLT2s, like, right, like I can do what's in my sphere as an internist. And I think that's what's so, why it's so important to engage primary care in this process. Because to me, we've missed an opportunity if, if Patients come to us as specialists. We had all of this time that we could have been working on these things. And then the third, oh, the carotid. Um, carotid, I don't necessarily put in this group. I think a bit more in cerebrovascular, but it, it, some people do. Um, so. I think it's the same medication. I know that's the same yeah. medication. That's the amount of life is the same. No, the compass data was not in that group. Yeah. 
All right. So oh, Dr. Lore. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, it is. Dr. Lore, yeah. this is yes. Dr. Papp. I'm sorry I didn't get a oh chance to go over there. Okay. But uh, I, I did I enjoy this and I, you know, I, I always knew you were a nitric oxide nut, but the, uh, uh, I did want to comment a little bit on celostazole uh, yes, because yes. I did the hemodynamic uh, studies on it as an inotrope uh, at the same time that the trial on dobutamine and milrinone for survival in CHF proved negative to survival and the manufacturer withdrew the application for celastazole as an inotrope based on the negative outcome of those trials. But nevertheless, we continue to use IV melanone. We continue to use IV dobutamine. We continue to use uh, uh, these drugs in it, but uh, never, uh, never have we looked at an oral uh, agent that could have two benefits in some of our patients. And I do not restrict celosazole uh, in patients with peripheral vascular disease uh, for a history of heart failure. It is, certainly it was uh, FDA at the time, they said we will never approve a drug that decreases survival, period. So they refused to ever look at it again. But then they did not take melanone or dopamine or dopamine off of our uh, uh, yes. list. So, you know, it, 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 just a reminder, it's it, the black box is a uh, a dirty word uh, when placed on a, uh, a, a drugs list. You know, um, I don't know if a person has both of these diseases, I do not restrict, you know, the use of celostazole if, you know. If anybody believes it does much good, um, you know, it's certainly still an option. Well, thank you, Marianne, for that perspective. And again, it's so great to hear from you. Um, I'm, I miss you. Um, yeah, I, I, know. I, think, <laughs> I think that um, to your point with a lot of these drugs and how we put guidelines together, um, there are those backstories and the FDA you know, the FDA black box isn't going to go away. Um, yeah, so yeah. then how do we manage that gray area? So um, yeah. I think your point is well taken. I only wish I could see what you were wearing today. That is always oh. my greatest joy. <laughs> I've got, I will take a picture just for you. All right, great. <laughs> Keep All in right. touch. All right. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>